We have reached the final installment of our series on the 13 principles of faith. For those of y'all counting, this is the 77th episode of this enormous project. We began it in 2019, more than five years ago. And this is the last one. It's a wonderful occasion to celebrate. It's a momentous moment. I think when we look back, we realize how much we have covered. For me, it was an absolutely exhilarating ride. I appreciate that you have joined me on it. And it's a privilege with the help of the might to reach to the end. Of course, we didn't cover everything. And there are a lot of elements of our philosophy and religion and eschatology that we have yet to cover. So I hope, please God, to continue this series, this Principles of Judaism, Torah 101 series. There are many foundations we still need to cover, but the th- our exploration of the 13 principles is ending uh, in, in this session. We're going to proceed, please God, with other areas, with other subjects as uh, time unfolds. I definitely want to continue an ongoing series of fundamentals of Judaism, a series of Torah 101 but this is the end of our exploration and explication of the 13 principles of Rambam. Again, Rambam codified for us 13 principles, 13 tenets of our religion. These are the foundations of our religion, and we're now in the final episode of the final principle. Principle number 13, the resurrection of the dead. And we leave off with lots of unanswered questions regarding resurrection. By definition, this subject is mysterious. We know so little about it. Resurrection is the bridge that connects the Messianic age to Olam Abba. And the Talmud tells us that even the prophets didn't have clarity in it. So, of course, we tried to study it and to understand and organize and categorize what we know and speculate what we can But today, in this final installment of the final principle, what I want to do is kind of go through some of the areas, some of the aspects, to to survey some of the aspects that are yet uncertain and to kind of lay out some of the various opinions on some of these matters. Of course, it's not comprehensive, but I hope it will round out our study of principle number 13, the concept of resurrection. And I want to begin with resurrection and reincarnation. So we spoke about resurrection and reincarnation in the past. The concept of resurrection, the basic idea is that, you know, a human in this world, it's an uncomfortable and unnatural union between a body and a soul. And there's a lot of tension that results from this marriage and after a person dies, well, the body, it goes back to where it where, where it came from. It goes back to the dust. And the soul, well, where does it come from? It comes from the upper ethereal spheres. And it returns to where it came from. And body and soul are both judged based upon their behavior in the lifetime of the person. If a soul does not fulfill its mission, does not arrive to heaven, sparkling clean, if it doesn't accomplish what it needs to accomplish in its lifetime, the principle of reincarnation says, well, the soul can be sent back. It can be paired with a second body and live a second or third, maybe even more, lifetime. So reincarnation gives the soul a second chance. Now, parenthetically, the commentaries tell us that in the messianic age, a central part of it is going to be reincarnation. And the reason is very logical. And we're going to see more about these ideas in a bit. Every soul must fulfill every single one of the 613 mitzvos in all three dimensions, which is which is in thought, in speech, and in action. Today, of course, this is not possible. It hasn't been possible for thousands of years. Why? Because there's a mitzvah to bring an Ola sacrifice. 
And maybe you can fulfill that in thought. You could study the laws of an old sacrifice and accomplish some element of that perfection, that perfection that is borne out by that mitzvah. But you cannot actualize it. So the Kabbalists tell us, Messiah comes, please God, really soon. The temple is rebuilt, please God, really soon. And there is a reinstitution of the system that really is the intended system. So sacrifices and all the mitzvos that were not able to be fulfilled are suddenly activated. And people who lived 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 1,500 years ago, they were not able to bring a sacrifice or fulfill any of the hundreds of mitzvos that relate to a temple-era world their soul needs something. The soul hasn't fulfilled all 613. And they're going to be reincarnated, be brought back to be able to achieve all 613, to achieve the perfection that the soul needs before it can be reborn in resurrection. So if you think about it, the, the concept of resurrection and reincarnation are, are similar. They're the soul coming back, but there's a difference. Reincarnation is when you haven't done your job. You need to come back for a second chance. Resurrection is when you have done your job, now it's time for you to come back and experience what you have earned with your righteousness and perfection. But if you think about it, they don't seem to correlate well. If resurrection is the reunification of body and soul, and suppose that that person, that soul, has been here a few times, so we have one soul and perhaps many bodies. Simplify it. Two bodies, right? You did half your job in the first go-around, you got a second chance, you fulfilled it. Super righteous. There are still two bodies vying for a single soul. So which body does the soul get repaired with? Which body will the soul be assigned to? This is a magnificent and fascinating question, and it's not our question, it's been asked and discussed by the great giants of our history. And it's an unanswered question, because as we shall see, there are so many different approaches by very reputable sources, and this adds to the general opacity that we have about the details of this principle. So the first idea I always like to remind people when they ask this question, there's a certain presupposition in the question. Whenever you have a question, you have to realize, what are the assumptions that go into the question? This question presupposes, it assumes, that, well, if a person lives only once, then you don't have the question, which body did they get assigned to? Because they get assigned to the body, that the only body that they had. But do they come back as a 70-year-old man, as a 90-year-old man? as a 25-year-old person. And we know every single moment you're, you're recycling millions of cells. Your, your body's very dynamic. A body's not a fixed thing. Even in a single lifetime, there are lots and lots of different bodies. So the, the question kind of needs to be understood in that context as well, because the body is not a fixed thing. And this is a helpful Exercise. You know, the, if the essential challenge of our life is what are we going to prioritize, our body or our soul, it's always important to remember the body that you have today is not even the same body that you have yesterday. And thus, the soul, it's much more connected to eternality than the body ever was. So if in one lifetime a person has lots and lots and lots and lots of different bodies, this is perhaps just an extension of that. You have two bodies, but really you have many, many, many different bodies even in one lifetime. Just like uh, the, the analogy that they give is the body is effectively just a, a garment for the soul. And you can open up someone's closet and see that there's lots and lots and lots of garments. They have all sorts of sweaters and cardigans and trousers and jackets and shoes. It's only one person, but they can maybe come in and out of 
different garments at will, maybe the soul and its relationship with the body is some way similar. But that said, the commentaries ask this question and they offer a variety of different approaches. And I want to, again, quickly survey some of the different ideas that are found in the great sources and the great commentaries on this question. So the first approach as to which body comes back. The first approach says, all of them, if you think about it, person lives, let's say, two, three, four lifetimes. And it's a process. You try to finish it all, finish your job, accomplish what you need to accomplish. You don't do it, you come back for round two, round three, round four. Okay, now you finished. Every body in that story of a lifetime, story of a person, story of a soul, each one of those bodies contributed towards the ultimate perfection. Each one of the bodies fulfilled some mitzvos. It can't be that a body did part of the job. It fulfilled the mitzvos that led to the perfection. And when the perfection is now going to be rewarded with the resurrection, the body that contributed is going to be excluded. The soul is going to re-enter and the body that contributed towards that is not going to be part of it. So the first approach argues that no, all the bodies are coming back. However, it's going to it's going to unfold in reverse order. So first, the final body is going to emerge. That's the body, after all, that it, that achieved the ultimate perfection, that, that succeeded in finishing the job. That's going to come up first and only subsequently will the other bodies be resurrected. Now, to further explain this approach, we have to understand that a soul is not a single thing. A soul is comprised of sparks. And again, we're using English terms for very advanced concepts that are totally above our understanding. But every soul can be divisible on some level. And thus you could have one soul that's going to be existing in a variety of bodies. So the person lived four lifetimes, there's four bodies, each one of those bodies is resurrected, and each one of those bodies has a spark, has an element of the soul. And truthfully, these are some of the ideas that we've talked about in the past. There are only 600,000 full souls. That's it. And ever since Sinai, there have been millions, hundreds of millions, billions of Jews that harbored parts of those souls. If all those souls are coming back, it's not going to be 600,000 people. These 600,000 root souls are going to be distributed amongst innumerable bodies, and thus lots of bodies can be sustained with a single soul. Each one has a little spark that animates it. So that's the first answer to this question. Which body will emerge of all the lifetimes that persons lived? All of them. A second approach argues that no. The person really has only one body. That's the OG, the original one, the first one. The rest of them are just spare parts. They're fill-ins. Their body doubles, and therefore it's only the first one that emerges. The other ones, you know, they were helpful for what the soul needed. The soul needed some sort of vessel. Okay, so the second body served just as a fill-in. But in truth, this soul and this body, it's only one pair. The original pair and everything else was just, was just a, a spare tire. That's the second approach. The third approach is that it's the final body alone. After all, the previous bodies, the previous lifetimes, they did not accomplish their mission. They didn't finish the job, and therefore they are discarded. Now, what happens to those bodies? It's not pleasant. If you look at the sources, bodies talk about how, the sources talk about how those Bodies that did not achieve their mission 
They're like a withered tree that does not yield fruit, and it's just, it disappears, and it's forgotten. And there's another deep point over here that must be understood. According to this approach, a person lives, let's say, four lifetimes, and they only achieve 50% in the first lifetime. And then another 25% in the second lifetime. And then another 20%. So, so the 95% done after three lifetimes, they come back and they finish in the fourth lifetime. According to this approach, the third approach that we're seeing here, which body emerges? It's only the final body. But wait a minute. The first body did 50% of the mitzvahs. 50% of the perfection was, was accomplished under the auspices of the first body. What happened to those mitzvahs that the first body did? How come it doesn't get the credit and the merit of those accomplishments? According to this approach, what ends up happening, and this is a fascinating idea, again, these are, whatever we're talking about now, it's all super secret. We don't know anything. This is all mysteries. We're just reading what it says in the sources and trying to understand it as best as we can. When there is resurrection, so body number one does 50% of what a person needs to accomplish, 50% of the way towards perfection. Now there's this handoff, passing of the baton from body one to body two. The incomplete body, body one, takes its mitzvot and its accomplishments and it bequeaths it to the successive body. Those mitzvahs, those accomplishments, that perfection gets absorbed in body number two. And it will pass it on to body number three and so on. And thus body number four is the totality, contains the totality of all the accomplishments of the previous bodies. And thus only the last one gets to bask in the pleasure of the resurrection. Only the last one, the one in which perfection was achieved, only that one will emerge according to this approach. And then there's the fourth approach. Persons lived a few different lifetimes. They progressively made their way towards perfection. Now it's time for resurrection. What body will emerge? The fourth approach argues that the body that will emerge will be a composite of the many bodies. And there's a logic to it. You know, we know that the, the human body, it's a perfect mirror image of the mitzvos. This is one of the themes I spoke about a lot in, in my book, which I'm sure all of y'all read rigorously. There are 613 mitzvos in the Torah, and that perfectly corresponds to the 613 parts of the human body, moreover, to the 613 parts of the human soul. There are 248 positive mitzvos, and that corresponds to the 248 limbs of the human body. And there are 365 prohibitions, and that corresponds to the 365 sinews in the human body. So every part of the body corresponds to a mitzvah. If a person does all six thirteen perfectly, they've now, so to speak, earned the perfection in all six hundred and thirteen parts of their body and their soul. And both of those can emerge with the resurrection. But suppose body number one only did 50% of the job. Did a, did a couple hundred mitzvahs to perfection. Well, what that means is it brought a couple of hundred organs, limbs, sinews towards the perfection. And thus, the body parts that achieved the perfection in life, the number one, those body parts are going to be part of the composite character that emerges. Body number two will finishes the job, let's say hopefully, or 
advances the job. What that means is that it does the mitzvos that earn the corresponding organs slash limbs slash sinews towards the perfection. So if body number one accomplished the mitzvah that corresponds to the right pinky, the right pinky of the resurrectionist is going to be the right pinky of body number one. If the the third or fourth or tenth body did the, the left pinky, well, that's going to be the left pinky of the resurrectionist body. And all the various parts are going to coalesce and form a single body. It's going to be a mashup of all the different bodies. Each mitzvah that earned the person perfection in that corresponding body, well, that that part, that limb, that sinew, will be part of the uh, the ultimate body that will emerge in the resurrection. Now, correspondingly, we are told, almost like a, a, a different version of this, maybe another approach, the soul is also sister of 13 parts. According to the opinions that argue that all the bodies that did mitzvos will all emerge with the resurrection, the parts of the soul that correspond to the mitzvos that the person or that that each respective body accomplished in their lifetime, that will be the part of the soul that is inserted, that spark, so to speak, that's inserted into the subsequent body. Again, I know this is complicated body and soul and sort of 13 parts and so on. But this is a way of saying there's lots and lots of different opinions. There's even an opinion that says that even the failed bodies will be infused with a new soul with the resurrection. Which one will it be? Which one of these is the consensus? There is none. We don't know. We will have to wait and see if we are lucky and fortunate and righteous and meritorious we will be privy to witness this. But again, we don't know. And by nature of this subject, it's so mysterious, there is so much that we don't know. And even what we do know, even what we are told in the reputable sources, there's still a film of obscurity covering everything. There's another unresolved question that we have to address. And that is resurrection for the non-Jew. Does a Gentile merit resurrection? Now, logically speaking, you would argue that they do. Because the Talmud says, and the Ramam codifies, that a righteous Gentile, someone who fulfills the seven Noahide laws, based upon the criteria that Rambam outlines, meaning that they're doing it because they believe in the Torah and they believe that Moshe gave the Torah, brought the Torah down from heaven, and so on. They are a righteous, a olam. they are righteous of the Gentiles and they merit Olam Abba. Well, is there any portal to Olam Abba without resurrection? So the logical argument argues if they merit Olam Abba, then you imagine they must have been resurrected, or that that must exist for them. The Talmud explicitly links the two. There is no portal, there is no pathway to Olam Abba outside of resurrection. Now, the problem is that the Midrash seems to say otherwise. The Midrash is talking about rain, and it compares rain to resurrection. This is a common theme. We've seen this in the past. One opinion of the Midrash says that rain, so wonderful, it's like resurrection. And it shows scriptural similarities between rain and resurrection. They're both, uh, in, in Scripture, there's the hand of God in both of them, and there's the opening of the portals in both of them, and then the blessing in the Amidah. We mentioned rain, and we mentioned resurrection. And in Scripture, they're both labeled with, with the notion of a song, and therefore, rain is so amazing, it's like resurrection. That's the first opinion in the Midrash. 
The second opinion says, no, no, no. Rain is not equal to resurrection. Rain is even greater than resurrection. Why? Because resurrection is wonderful, but it's only for humans. There is no resurrection for animals. But rain, who benefits from rain? Everyone, humans, animals, everyone benefits from rain. And that's proof number one that resurrection is greater. I'm sorry, that rain is greater than resurrection. Proof number two, resurrection, it's only for the Israelites. It's only for the Jews. But rain, who benefits from rain? Everyone, the Jews and the non-Jews alike. So logically, we would say that non-Jews should merit resurrection. The Midrash seems to say otherwise. And the reason why I say it seems to say otherwise is because the, the commentaries offer clarification. When the Midrash says that resurrection is only for the Jews, so the commentaries say, Lav dafka no, 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 this doesn't mean that it's only for the Jews, because after all, the righteous of the Gentiles, they, they merit Olamba, and they will emerge in resurrection. So when it says Israelites, it means the righteous ones. That's what the commentaries say. So the, the Midrash seems to imply that the non-Jews do not merit resurrection, but the commentaries offer a clarification and say that, well, they actually do. Now, the Sefer Ikrim, which is a, a medieval-era book on principles of Jewish philosophy, he understands as a given the Gentiles do not merit resurrection. And then he has the same question that we had. Wait a minute. If Gentiles do not merit resurrection, well, the Talmud does say, the Rambam does say that they merit Olam Abba. Well, if resurrection is the only pathway to Olam Abba, how can it be if they don't merit resurrection? So what he says is that Indeed, Gentiles do not merit resurrection, and the Olam Abba that they earn, it's only on a lower level, it's the Olam Abba that precedes the resurrection, what we would call the Olam HaNeshamot, the, the, world of the, the, the world of the souls, which is the world that people go to after they die, which you, perhaps you recall, you recall, that's a world that's very similar to Olam Abba but they will not, in fact, be resurrected. So we have lots of different opinions over here. And again, what will be? We, we cannot answer these questions conclusively. All we could do is share what we discover in the words of the sages. This, too, remains an unanswered question. It is interesting that some of the great sages organized essays, long and intricate essays and essays and treatises on the subject of resurrection. And I want to go through one of them. We mentioned this uh, some time ago. The Sa'ad Yagon, one of the great Gonim, so he lived like 1,500 years ago. In his book, Emunos Videos, section number seven, chapter number eight, he lists... 10 fascinating questions and answers related to resurrection. Now, some of the questions we've addressed in the past, but I thought it would be helpful and beneficial to help round out our understanding of the resurrection, to just go through them, see the 10 questions, and see his answers. And again, I will remind you some of the questions we've talked about in the past, and we've seen different approaches, which adds again to the conclusion that we have that not everything that we study is universally accepted. So the first question that he asks, very basic question, is who will be resurrected? And his answer, called tzaddik, every tzaddik, every righteous person, ubal teshuva, and every penitent. And he has a whole paragraph talking all about this. And he ends off with a very heartening Line, Vani Omer, and I say, 
There's only a small amount of our nation that die without repentance. In our nation, at least, the majority says Sa'ad Yagon, the majority will repent before they, they pass, and thus they will merit to be resurrected. Okay, question number one. Question number two. After someone is resurrected, so it's the Messianic era, temples rebuilt, now there's this process of resurrection. Will those who are resurrected, will they die subsequently? So you come back alive, will you have subsequent death afterwards? And he says, no, they won't die. Instead, they're going to seamlessly transition from the times of Messiah, which is the times in which resurrection happens, into Olam Abba, the world to come. And he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud says that the dead, that the Almighty will in the future bring to life, they will not die again. This is interesting because we've seen, if I recall correctly, we've seen other opinions on this question. Question number three is a fascinating one. So wait a minute. We're expecting a lot more people in the world. They're all coming back. Is there room for everyone? Overpopulation. Is there enough room for all these people? Millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of people? Who knows? So there's a whole long calculation. How long has the world been around for? How long has our nation been around for? How many generations? And, and he you know, does some ballpark back of the napkin, back of the envelope math, and he, he ultimately concludes there's plenty of room. And then the fourth question. Will people recognize their relatives we think about it, oh, the resurrection, we'll get the gang back together, we'll have family barbecues and vacations. This is an interesting question. Will the newly rebuilt, newly reconstructed people even recognize their family? That's a fascinating question, because we, we think, that well, how, how could they not? And he arrives at his answer from a very unconventional angle. He says, well, the leaders of the people, the prophets, the kings, they have to be recognizable. We have to know, like, who, you know, who's Moshe and who's Aaron, the high priest. They have to have some sort of mark that makes them recognizable. And by that Logic, he says, well, people need to recognize each other, and everyone will need to be paired with their tribal affiliation, so they need to know who's who, and therefore, the most of the people are recognizable in the world of the resurrection. Someone comes back alive, we'll know who they are, if we're, again, meritorious to be around and to, and to be privy to that. But that's how he answers question number four. Question number five, will people emerge healed? Someone who lived a life and they were blind or they had some sort of illness, malady, deformity, or disability. Is that going to carry over? Or will they emerge healthy? Interesting question. And he gives a very interesting answer. He says that they initially will be reanimated with their blemish, with their illness or deformity, so that the people will recognize them. But subsequently, the Almighty will heal them, and they'll be flawless. And he cites Talmudic proof to this and scriptural proof to this. The verse says, I will cause death, I will bring back to life, Vani Arpen, I will heal. So there's death, and there's life, i.e. resurrection, and then there's I will heal, God will heal only after the resurrection. Now someone is resurrected. The body and soul are now once again back together. 
but it's not yet Olam Abba. It's in the Messianic era. And there's going to be a coexistence of, of non-resurrected humans and resurrected humans. And we know non-resurrected humans, they need to eat and they need to drink and they they procreate. What about those who are resurrected? Will they eat? Will they drink? Will they procreate? He says yes. Just as the boy that Elijah revived and the boy that Elisha revived, they were standard humans. And they ate, and they drank, and they got married. So too it will be in the time of the resurrection. Perhaps we can even add, there was a third resurrection that happened in the times of the prophets. So we have the, that of Ezekiel. So we have that of Elisha, that of Elijah, there's also the bones, the dry bones that Ezekiel revived. And the Talmud cites a dispute as to whether or not it was that that story, that narrative. I think it's chapter 37 of Ezekiel. Is that real? Is that a metaphor? And the Talmud cites a proof that it was real. Because one of the descendants of those people that was revived says, well, here I am. I, I, I even have the tefillin that was owned by my great-great-grandfather who was brought back to life by Ezekiel. So if the Talmud cites a proof from the descendant of someone that was brought back to life in the times of Ezekiel, it must be that those who are brought back to life are, in fact, the kind of people who bear children. Accordingly, the Sa'ad Yagon asks question number seven. So the bodies that are reunited with the souls in the times of Messiah during the resurrection, at some point, they're not going to die, right? At some point, they're going to transition into a very different paradigm, into Olam Abba. Well, in Olam Abba, we know there is no drinking, there is no eating, there is no procreating. The Talmud says that explicitly. So what's the process? What's the mechanism by which a human, the way we think of it, physical, hosting, harboring, a spiritual, eating, drinking, procreating, how does that transition, how does that transfer, how does the handoff happen between the paradigm of Olam Abba? And again, he gives a fascinating answer. He says, well, we have a precedent for that. We have an example of that. There is a person whose name we all know, who lived like an ordinary human, and then for multiple stints, transitioned and lived like Olam Abba, life, and then came back. Of course, we're talking about Moshe. Moshe, he got married. He had children. He goes to Sinai, goes up to heaven, 40 days and 40 nights, no eating, no drinking, no sleeping. He's living on this dimension of Olam Abba. And he comes back down, and then he's here with us. Even though he had some of that special experience, he retained some of that. That's why his face, his face was glowing. He had to wear a mask, as we know. But that's the precedent. You have someone who is doesn't die. Doesn't die. There isn't this total reset. He's living on one level, one dimension, and then suddenly he just transitions to a different dimension. That's what's going to happen in the times of the resurrection. For those who have been resurrected, they're going to be resurrected. They'll eat and drink and procreate. And at some point, there'll be some process by which, like Moshe, they're going to transition into the realm, into the dimension, into the paradigm of Olam Abba. Question number eight. And by the way, I'm just giving you the question and the answer. There's a lot of commentary that he offers to explain his rationale, his reasoning. But I find it fascinating that Saad Yagon, one of the one of the great Gonim, this is the era that precedes even, even Rashi, right? This is the era right after the writing of the Talmud. He's organizing for us the, the ten dilemmas, the ten the ten unanswered questions about this subject. 
And he gives the questions, and he gives his answers. Question number eight. Can those who were resurrected, so these are righteous people, they come back to life. Righteous people, penitents, they come back to life. And now they're alive, body and soul, eating and drinking. Can they become corrupt now? Can they become sinners? Obviously, he's under the impression that even though it's the times of Messiah, there is at least some dimension of free will that still remains. So, is it within the realm of possibility that someone could be so righteous that they merited resurrection, but now, in the time that they are resurrected, they become a sinner and become someone who loses their eligibility for Omaba? Could it be that the resurrectionist will not merit Omaba? And he gives a, a surprising answer. He says that the Almighty... He knows that the people, the righteous people who have chosen good and have chosen good to the exclusion of bad, the ones that he will resurrect are the ones that he knows for sure will not become sinful. So in fact, what he's saying is that there's not going to be this unrestricted free will that exists in our understanding of the world, that will not exist in the times of Messiah when the people are resurrected. And it's possible that this answer has to do with the timeline of resurrection. We know that, that resurrection doesn't, doesn't just happen all at once. And we're going to see later on, there's even an opinion that argues that resurrection happens by alphabetical order, which I found to be absolutely fascinating. <laughs> But it seems like the most righteous people are going to be resurrected first. And those righteous people are going to help accelerate this perfection and elevation of the world and the elimination, or at least the diminishing initially, of the free will. So maybe someone will only be resurrected at the point in time in the Messianic era, in the era of resurrection, when it's no longer a threat that they will have an episode of recidivism and will become wicked after they've been resurrected. So maybe that's the reason why only those who are super righteous, that we're not worried at all, will become sinners. Only they are resurrected at the beginning and they help accelerate the process of perfection of the world and the elimination of the Eitzra and thus elimination of free will. And thus, as things change over time, those who may be a little bit less resolute and strong, they can be resurrected and now it's not a threat to them, and so on, until the very end when there's no longer a threat to anyone. But it's, again, these are such fascinating subjects, and we're just going through it quickly because we don't know anything. We're just trying to read and understand as best as we can. The ninth question. It's the times of Messiah. It's the times of Resurrection. The temple is built. All the mitzvahs are in full swing. People come back to life. We know they're not going to sin. That's question number eight already. So they're going to only do mitzvahs. Will they merit reward for the righteousness, for the mitzvahs, for the merits that they do, that they that they do in the times of Messiah? That's question number nine. He says, yes. Why? Because there is no service of God that does not carry with it reward. And finally, the tenth question. What about the people that are alive in the era of Messiah? They were alive when Messiah came. Or the people that are born in the times of Messiah. So resurrection is already happening. And there is a coexistence of people from the first style, right? Humans, 
that were not dead and resurrected. You have humans like us, if we're fortunate to be around for this. And suddenly there's people are alive. Abraham's alive. Isaac's alive. Moshe's alive. And regular Joe Schmo's up alive, like us. And people are still procreating. So there's new babies being born. So what happens to all those humans when resurrection is already ongoing? Do they die and then they are resurrected? What happens to them? So he says, listen, this, this question, the verses don't talk about it, the tradition doesn't talk about it, our sages never spoke about this. But he says there's three different approaches. The first idea is that they will live and not die. It's those who are alive in the time of resurrection, they have not yet died. They will just avoid the whole subject of resurrection. They'll live and not die at all. That's one opinion. The second approach is that they will die and they will be resurrected. So some people died in the past and were resurrected, and some people are going to die now and will subsequently be resurrected. The third opinion, and this is the one that he favors, is that they're going to live a very long life and they'll die. And they won't be resurrected until the end of the era of resurrection until Olam Abba. And he has a whole paragraph explaining why he is partial to this third approach. Again, this is fascinating that we have we have Sa'ad Yagron lived again hundreds of years before the Rambam. He speaks about this subject, the subject of resurrection, and he this is just the end. The, the end of his whole treatment of this subject are these ten questions, which I found to be very fascinating. And worthy of us going through them, even on a superficial level, to help us understand some of the other variables and subjects of this fascinating principle, principle number 13, the resurrection of the dead. And again, he's not the only one who writes about it. Ramchal writes about it. The Barbanel is a very long introduction to his commentary on the book of Isaiah, where he talks about this. But for us, we have to end off with the humility in acknowledging and professing that there is so, so, so much that we don't know. Again, I, I found this novel opinion that says, even the time of resurrection, even the time of resurrection, when, when the resurrection happens, I found an opinion that says that it's going to be done in alphabetical order. I don't know what the rationale behind that is, but I thought, well, oh, again, the Wallbees are getting the short end of the stick, always at the end of the alphabet. But of course, that's nonsense, because I imagine it'll be by the Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet, and our name in Hebrew is Volbe, which is a Vav, which is the sixth letter, so it's, it's towards the beginning. But again, there are other subjects that we have not really fully addressed. We talked about the, the great and awesome Day of Judgment, which is that third judgment, not done, not in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, not when a person dies, but at the end of days. When that is, it's a question we don't know exactly when that is. But there's going to be this great and awesome Day of Judgment where everything's going to be calculated, not just a person's righteousness, merits, and a person's sins, a person's demerits, but all the after effects and the after effects and the cascading repercussions of a person's deeds. That's terrifying. Even, even Samuel the prophet was terrified of that day. The first murder, the first homicide is of course Cain and Abel. And if you read Rashi in, in chapter 4 of Genesis, God comes to Cain and says, where's your brother? And he responds, and my brother's keeper, as we know. And God tells him, the bloods of your brother are crying out to me from the ground. And Rashi says, no, no, why is it the bloods, the plural? It should be the blood. And Rashi says, no, 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 no. Cain didn't just murder one person. Abel, he was destined to have children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great, great, 
grandchildren, and so on, to the end of time. And all that was murdered by Cain. So how many people did Cain kill? We still don't know. That is still being tallied. And that's what's going to happen, the great and awesome Day of Judgment, the full tally. And of course, there's a negative of that, and there's a positive of that. You think about the Dafyomi system. It's only 100 years old. The great Rabbi Shapiro comes up with a system of studying the Talmud one page a day and doing it across the world on the same schedule. And there are millions of people who are studying a page of Talmud every single day because of that. So how many mitzvahs does he have? How many pages of Talmud study accrue to his system? We don't know. Great and awesome day of judgment that will be tallied. This, of course, is big encouragement for us to do things that are good, but to also try to think about how we can influence others and get to the top of this uh, multi-level marketing pyramid. When that is, what that looks like, why it's so dreadful and terrifying and awesome, there's a lot of opacity in these subjects. And we get the sense that it's deliberately concealed. What about the seventh millennium? And the uh, death of the world and the rebirth of the world, there are all sorts of unresolved dilemmas. Elijah never died. The Talmud tells us that he has some role to play in resurrection. We know that he he did resurrection once. He's still alive, so he's not a recipient of resurrection. And again, the sources say that he plays some sort of role in, in that. We know that he has a role in, in Messiah, in, in being the harbinger of Messiah. What is that, what, what, what exactly that is? Again, we're leaving off with some loose ends, but I'm okay with that. We have still a lot to study, but we did 77 episodes on the 13 Principles of Faith. And I think, I hope, I pray that we succeeded somewhat in our mission of trying to cover these subjects as rigorously as we can. Please, God, I hope to continue our Torah 101 series, the series on the foundations of Judaism, the fundamental philosophy of Judaism. I know there are some items in my notes that I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to leave that. Well, once we finish the principles, then we'll delve into some of these subjects. There are some more proofs of Torah. I want me to spend some time on proofs of Torah, more proofs of Torah. We covered that a lot, but we still have more to do. I remember distinctly that we, when we talked about Israel, the state of Israel, and its placement, so to speak, in our philosophy, we didn't give it the full treatment. The subject of chosen people, there are lots of other subjects that we can describe as essential to our philosophy. And please, God, we will continue double-clicking on some of the subjects that we covered briefly and going onward and upward, please, God, on some of the other subjects that relate to foundational principles of our religion and philosophy and eschatology. I'm looking forward to continuing this study with y'all. If you have any ideas, any suggestions, and of course, any questions, comments, or feedback, send me an email, rabbiwolby at gmail.com.